and welcome to this episode of Radically Rational, the podcast. You know what we're about, at least I hope you do. We're about bringing facts back into fashion. We're making simple sanity sexy again. We're telling you that crazy ain't cool. And if I violate that rule, I'm going to hear about it from an eight-year-old girl. Makes no sense whatsoever. Keep me in line. That's the way it's supposed to work. Okay, so today's subject on Radically Rational is Radically Rational. What's this all about? And there are a couple reasons we're doing this. Because we want to introduce you to the concept, and we want to please you and entertain you and hold your interest and maybe give you some things to think about. But the other thing is that periodically we on Radically Rational need to do that for ourselves so that we understand that, so we kind of revisit these principles. So to help me do that, wow, it's kind of the reason we're here. I'd like to introduce you to a gentleman that I'm just going to say it, is the absolute best and most experienced and knowledgeable podcast producer in the country. He is the founder and owner of the best podcast production house in the country, Game Day Media (laughs) in San Antonio. It's just the truth, and we would not be here without him. But one of the things that's great is not only is he technically not just proficient, he's a genius, and that goes for the rest of his family and the people that work here, but you and I kind of got this concept at the same time. Yeah, first of all, thanks for being allowing me to be in this chair. I am certainly a poor substitution for Anthony Pittman, and I will never be in a position to say I am, but from that perspective, it's, it's really a different uh, opportunity for me to sit in this chair and to talk to you because radically rational. And I want to say one other thing about the intro. I thought you were going to go the Seinfeld route and say, we're going to do a show about nothing because <laughs> you remember the episode. I do. I do. And, and so I'm glad you, you had the diplomacy not to do that because radically rational really has been an important podcast, not only for, for us uh, that are involved with it, but We've gotten so much positive feedback about what's going on with Radically Rational and the different topics that are tackled and the nonsense that has been exposed. And so I want to thank you and Joe, your wife, for really creating this concept because it's not only is it more than needed, people are dying. To, I mean, they're not, they're not literally dying, but they are yearning for this kind of information because of of what goes on in the media as a whole right now. Well, let me give you just a a little glimpse about how this happened, and I'll keep it brief. I was working as a television news director in a local market, and one day I just had one of these I-can't-stand-this-anymore reactions. And particularly what I was talking about is that more and more, and you see this in the news business, but if you're paying attention anywhere, you've seen this evolve or devolve. We find ourselves in a world now where facts just don't matter. We've got more information and less wisdom than ever before, and everybody at all points on the compass have granted themselves the license to just reject facts A fact is anything they want to believe. A hoax is anything they don't want to believe. And there can't be anything more destructive to a society. You know, historically, we would draw different conclusions, but it would be from the same set of facts. Mm -hmm. Now there are no facts. It's completely untethered. And I know this is going to sound melodramatic, but that sounds like a pretty good way to kill a country and a civilization and maybe make a species extinct. I don't understand that aspect of what's going on. To what end does that benefit any of us? You know, I I, I always think of um, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, as different as they could be politically. Uh, And when they were on the floor, they had their battles. But when they clocked out, they respected each other. They spent time with each other's families. They were cordial with each other. And those days just seem to be gone. And... You know, people, I find it really difficult when people say, well, if you don't, if you're not a a fan of Trump or you're not a fan of Biden or you're not a fan of Obama, then I can't deal with you. Really? Because in 85 to 90 percent, we probably have the same views and the same values and we can't 
respect the differences that we have. And, and that's where I really uh, am disappointed at where we're at as a country right now, because it's almost impossible to argue with someone or reason with someone on um, their, and it become it quickly becomes a shouting match. And so, yeah, I just respectfully disagree with people, but I, I will not argue with them on their point because it's not going to change. And, and for some people, that's the fuel they need to be to stay fired up and to stay vigilant in their cause, whatever that is. Uh, versus um, just saying, okay, brother or sister, I, I I respectfully disagree, but we can still be friends. That that those days are few and far between now, and and it's and it's sad to me, and, and more than anything, it's it's just it's it's sad. John, to me, ultimately, a mind that can't be changed is a mind that can't be saved. I as I get older. I realize that uh, I want to spend time with people that I enjoy spending time with. Mm -hmm. And luckily, uh, from my upbringing and from my family and from my experiences, that is a spectrum of people, it, a spectrum of all beliefs, all religions, all colors, all creeds. I am so blessed to, and I'm, it doesn't make me better than anybody else. It just gives me perspective that if you eat the same food, if you read the same book every week, that's not what life's about. It's it, open your mind. If you're not receptive to proven information and facts, and if you're not willing to have your mind changed or altered in the presence of established facts, it's not only ignorant. It's not only intellectually vacuous. I think it's a form of cowardice. Sure, you can take videos out of context from time to time and see the snippets that you want to see. But so many more times, there are irrefutable situations that take place that it shouldn't even be an argument if it happened or not. And, and how I respond to that, being irrational because of the situation that I saw, but I didn't really see. Does that make sense? It, it, it's, it's confusing. None of this makes sense. But now people do that knowing full well, whichever direction this is coming from, that half the people they say that to are going to believe it because they want to believe it. And those liars lie upward. Yes. It seems like not only is there no consequence, but they're rewarded. rewarded. And so from that perspective, I, I just watched a, a mini series called Inventing uh, Anna. And it was about a, a lady from Germany that uh, uh, really built the uh, upper crust of New York and, and other places out of millions of dollars. And uh, she's out of prison. She did very little time. She stole millions of dollars. And she's back doing exactly what she was doing <clears throat> previously. And no consequences, gets a Netflix series gets more exposure, and is nothing but a liar, and hurt people, and changed a lot of people's lives. And I, that's a that's a small example. Maybe no one was killed in that situation or, or maimed or injured, but so many times those people that do lie, lie in such a way that they do create mayhem, and there seem to be no consequences. Look at the... Look at when uh, the uh, when Wall Street collapsed, and not a single executive did any time, and they lied. They lied to their shareholders. They lied to the public. They lied to the uh, SEC. They lied to everybody, and there were no consequences. And I don't understand that because if I were to go out and do something, I would be under the jail. But it seems like the really skilled liars just lie themselves up to the top. Lying as a way of life. You know, John, I, I sometimes get asked by the people who follow Radically Rational, are you coming from a political vector? Yes and no. Let me explain what I mean by that. We are really nonpartisan in the sense that we owe no allegiance to a political party. I think what you and Anthony bring to the table are your personal experiences that you uniquely have lived and Anthony has uniquely lived certainly and to me that 
aspect of this show uh, not only, in my opinion, cast a wide net because you guys are very, you have a lot of similarities, but you also have a lot of differences. And I think that from the perspective of, as you said, not having a set agenda, you don't lean this way, you don't lean this way as far as formal political parties. And I've never understood the two-party system either. And, and within that, I'll just say this, and maybe you can give me a civics lesson because I don't understand this at all. So on the right, you have, we love freedom, we love this, we love that. But when it comes to music and the arts, we want to label something as as not suitable for this, or we want to ban this, or what is uh, what is pornography, or what is this. And then on the left, you have these free-thinking and open-minded, and, and a lot of people would say evolved, and yet the reliance on government to do things for... I, I don't understand those dynamics. So You, you just nailed it. If, if you could help me out with that, Paul, I would be great grateful. I wish I could, but this is what has happened. It's because of this binary thing that we have created. You know, Republican, Democrat, let me suggest this. The two words in the English language that serve us the most poorly right now are conservative and liberal. Mm. And here's why. Because it dominates our discourse. It dominates our every thought. But there's nobody out there who could define it to save their life. And it's all the contradictions, John, that you were just talking about. Mm. This party says that we're for this, but then we do things that are 180 degrees out of phase with that, and the other party is guilty of it as well. Mm -hmm. So if the foundation of everybody's discussion is conservative and liberal, but we can't agree on what that is, in right. many cases, the person who self-identifies as either conservative or liberal, they don't know what it means either. Right. And other you, and other if, than my buddies identify this way, so that's what I am too. And if you call yourself a centrist, oh, you're just a fence. You, you, you're oh, on the fence. man. You, you can't make up. You're indecisive. And I, and I think being a centrist isn't in itself a bad thing. You know, I, I can personally, I consider myself very socially liberal and fiscally conservative, sure. which in a lot of people would say that's a libertarian. I don't consider myself necessarily a libertarian, but I look at each issue for what it is on its own merit and don't have to be in camp red or camp blue to make those decisions. And I think we have really gotten polarized in I, I've got to be in this camp or I've got to be in this camp rather than thinking because, again, it goes back to what you were saying. People don't aren't open to the possibilities of something that's, outside of their little cocoon within that team red or team blue. And, and it's, it's, it's maddening at times because you and I could be fighting for the same thing, but if you're wearing the red jersey and I'm wearing the blue jersey or vice versa, we're not going to agree because we just can't. Well, when the system is set up to be binary, right. that's kind of the, the ultimate result. Yeah, and, and, you know, having done some homework and, and studied this, the opportunity to allow alternative voices to even be part of debates, for example, the television debates, um, to get exposure for new ideas. You have to have so many hoops and have to have so much money and have to have so many things that you have to be um, um, assessed to be worthy. You know, even with the debates, if you only have what was it, the threshold, under 8% of the vote, you're you not going to be on the stage. You're not here, yeah. So how, and that person that's got 2% may just not be, have the financial backing, but if somebody's got an idea that could take root, uh, we're in a essence, in a lot of ways, stifling and stamping out some people that could have some really good ideas Um uh, on all sides, it doesn't matter what side of, of the spectrum you're on, but because of the formality, and, and you may disagree with me on this, but I believe that Washington, D.C. as a whole is, in some respects, a good old boys club. And, oh, for sure. And if you're not part of that, 
you're not going to be invited to the party. Uh, there is a growing number of people in this country who think that free speech means you can say anything you want to without repercussions, without consequences, and if anybody calls you on it, their free speech rights are getting violated. Mm. Let's back up, not just logically, but under the Constitution and under our free speech laws, libel laws, slander laws, etc. All right, all it means is that you are free to have something come flying out of your pie hole in the first place <laughs> and free to publish it or broadcast it in the first place. So in other words, there's no prior restraint. Nobody can keep you from doing it. That does not mean that the consequences that you suffer for doing that cannot be enormous. And you cannot say I'm immune to prosecution or condemnation because those are my free speech rights. No, you're free to say it. You are not freed from the consequences of what you say. And in particular, there are a lot of different reasons for this. The internet is one, the information age is one. Everybody can be their own gatekeeper now, which means they can believe anything they want to, and they can find something somewhere to back it up, and it's only from people who are lying to the same degree that they are lying. But it doesn't mean you can't challenge, can't be challenged on this. And I get very frustrated sometimes when essentially somebody says, my fiction rebuts your fact. And if you deny that, then you're violating my free speech rights. No, when you speak in the first place, you're introducing yourself into the arena of ideas, and sometimes you may get your face pounded. You, you hit something there when you talked about the, the fact that people think they have the right to have their opinion respected. And I, I take real issue with that as well because... I don't ever want to take away somebody's um, humanity as a person. Even sometimes they, they don't deserve it. I, I never want to hit below the belt in a way that's going to be um, construed as just taking a cheap shot. However, there are enough people out there that feel that, that – I'm going to say this, and it's probably going to tick off some people out there watching, but – we live in an entitlement society unlike I've ever seen. And I'm not even going to throw that on the younger people. I'm going to throw that on us as a society. Oh, fair. We Absolutely. have never felt more entitled to, and again, it goes back to what I was talking about at the very beginning, this selfishness. You know, there was a time where if you had a flat tire on the side of the road, I'm going down uh, Ranch Road 12, I'm going to pull over and I'm going to help you fix because that tire. Because it's the right thing to do. Because it's the right thing to do. And now if it interrupts my day or it takes away from my next selfie or it does this or it does that, to hell with you, what about me? And that's what the – unfortunately, that's the society by and large that's portrayed out there now, we find goodness in our neighbors, and we find those things that are out there. They still exist. I don't want to be that cynical. But there is a contingency of people in this country. It's to hell with you. What about me? When am I going to get mine? What are you doing for me? And that is, I think that's a, almost a, a tectonic shift in our thinking as a country. Completely agree. I mean, the World War II generation... Uh, my wife and I are, are both boomers, children of that generation. Uh, our fathers, uh, you would say, were somewhat engaged uh, in the fight for freedom. Uh, my father was a survivor of the Rapido River Massacre. You might want to look that up. And my wife's father was a survivor of the Bataan Death March. So you can knock it off with the lack of Americanism or patriotism. I, would you mind? I, I really don't need that lecture because I realize I'm lucky to be an American, but it's because of the principles that we have. And John, to what you're speaking about, what really bothers me is the way the most precious thing we have, which is freedom, has been redefined in a very cynical, selfish way. Freedom has never meant to hell with you 
I can do anything I want to do. I have no social responsibility. This is an easy example, but it's the first one that comes to mind. In World War II, at night, neighborhoods, folks had to turn their lights off. So if there were bad guys in the sky, they couldn't tell where you were. Okay, so we all might live. So is that socialism? Okay, one person leaves their lights on in the name of personal freedom. There goes the neighborhood. And we see this happen all the time. Freedom does not mean that you are freed of all social responsibility. This is a cheap example, too, or an easy one. Vaccines. We've been getting vaccines for 70 years to go to school. The World War II generation, you want to question their commitment to freedom, their bravery, their intelligence? Their reaction was largely, here's my arm, stick me. Yeah, and I've got a polio scar from my polio vaccine. I'll take it even a step further, Paul, and say that freedom has been co-opted and rebranded. Perfect. Because it has. And uh, there are lots of things that I don't like personally. I, I don't like when people burn flags. I don't like when people badmouth our president. I don't like yeah. when people do that. But you know what? That's freedom. That's freedom. The ability to allow people within our society to do things that you don't agree with that fall in the in the purview of what freedom really is. Freedom is not um, unwavering uh nationalism which you know that's a that's another big topic and and i love this country as much as anybody i i have never um wanted to live anywhere else but here never wanted to spend another second of my time except when i go visit other countries but but that rebranding and if and if you don't agree with all lives matter, you're a jerk. If you don't agree with these colors don't run, you're a jerk. Right. And I just think we're a, a more, um, I don't know the right word, I, I think we're a more complex people. You know, we, we, we live in our own bubbles on, on a daily basis, and we get comfortable with the people we're around and, and – and maybe those those um, things don't change from day to day. But when you step out of your bubble and you see the rest of the world and how they're living and how, you know, our fundamental uh, things that we take for granted uh, are because of protests and are because of people that serve our country and because people that uh, want better working conditions for, for their their families and their you know their communities that's all part of the fabric of freedom it is not a unilateral uh belief system but it's been co-opted into turning red white and blue bad anything else or red white and blue good anything else bad and if 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 you're not with us you're against us you know and, and patriotism has never meant blind obedience no never never and an unwillingness to question that's right I think it gives us the freedom to question that more would, than any other society. That would be the point. And look, we have symbols in our society, and that's a good thing. It's, it's a normal thing. It's a human thing. But we have to remember that the important thing about symbols is what they symbolize. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not necessarily the symbol it, itself. Um, it, it's really gotten frustrating and we're talking about radically rational and what the concept is. And one of the reasons we're doing this is because we who are involved need to periodically retouch this and redefine it for ourselves and remember what this is all about. Here's what it isn't about. Um, this is not some staid, tired, stodgy, academic bow tie, tweed jacket thing. We're here largely to entertain you. Uh, and I think if you go back and look at the podcast and look at, I, I, I think we make a pretty good effort to do that. And know this, yes, we take the subject matter in many cases very, very seriously because it is serious. But I swear to you, we make a huge effort never to take ourselves seriously. And poking a little fun at ourselves is a big part of what this is about. 
Um, but we're talking past each other, obviously. We've gotten to the point where we think we have the right to assume a person's every position on every subject based on a position they took on a subject. Okay, I know how you feel about that, so I now am free to draw this completely groundless conclusion that I know how you feel about everything. Right, and, and that's, we're not monolithic creatures. We're just not. We, we have our own habits. We have our own traditions. We have our own beliefs that uh, make us individuals. I'm a, I am a true believer in the individual. I'm, I'm not what you would consider a collectivist because you may be like we can both be fans of the same team and that puts us in a in a category right but you may love italian food and i may be a mexican food connoisseur and and but there's no angst there why is there angst in people's differences i do not understand that i think it's short-sightedness i think people lose out on the experience of being humans when they buttonhole themselves into such a tight knot that they can't do anything to get out of that. And I think from a uh, perspective of what radically rational is, this is a rest stop on the superhighway of insanity. And this is a place where people can pull in. Maybe a yellow light anyway. <laughs> you know, slow it down a little bit. <laughs> just, just for a little while where you can have these wonderful conversations. I mean, you've spoken with journalists, with musicians, with political folks, with leaders in education. You've, you and Anthony have done a phenomenal job of, of having a well-rounded uh, approach to speaking on these issues. And I think that... By and large, I would say completely, every conversation has, I've gleaned information, I've learned something new, I was open to receive it, and I wasn't offended in any way because part of it, and I'll give you and, and Anthony all the, the, the credit, is how you approach the subjects. You're not coming in here with an antagonistic approach you're coming in it with a okay we're going to have a conversation and whatever direction that conversation goes we're going to keep it civil we're going to hear both sides we're going to understand and we're going to try to extract more information so we can learn more and i think that approach to the subject matters that have been uh, uh, discussed here on radically rational is unfortunately a not unfortunately for the show, but unfortunately for society, that is a refreshing approach to these types of topics. And unfortunately, that's not what we see on the, on the big media uh, networks and, and on our boob tubes at home. One last thing I want to talk about, game day media. This is an absolute phenomenon your story personally and how you got involved in podcast production and the reasons you had for that is really cool and really inspiring and I would say really American. Just kind of give us the cliff notes a little bit. Yeah, so my background is in hospital administration. I did that for 27 years or so and I wanted to do something differently. And uh, my wife says, well, what do you like? I said, I like sports and I like food. And, uh, and that's not a lie. It's a good start. You can tell. And uh, she said, well, if you can go make a living doing that, go do it. So um, I spent about 18 months. I traveled across the country, went to stadiums all over the country, and um, interviewed people out in parking lots before sporting events, uh, Kentucky Derby, NASCAR events, NHR events, any you know, baseball, went to the College World Series, and just saw this culture. And we did some market research. 50 million people tailgate every year. 50 million. And so I was like, there's an opportunity here to, uh, to celebrate the American sports fan. And so we created a company called the American Tailgaters Association. We traveled around the country. We did a Big 12 tour, a Big 10 tour, a Big East tour. We, we were all over the place. And, uh, and that spawned doing a, a Food Network show with uh, Al Roker. And, and it just really became a, a little, little media uh, 
endeavor that started in my garage and grew to to uh, national exposure. And so whenever I decided that being on the road 51 and a half weeks out of the year was not what I wanted to do forever, we sold that, but we started a company called Game Day Media. And that's where the name came from is because we were out in the ecosystem of these sports fans on game day. And fast forward um, to 2022, we, we are rarely in the sports uh, arena now because we deal with uh, podcasts from education to uh, we have some wonderful people in the medical field and the business leaders. I work with Jeffrey Hazlett, who is a former uh, CMO of Kodak and uh, uh, in New York City, and we have a partnership with him uh, to um, working with David Robinson and his son on a, on a podcast that they did uh, right before COVID hit. And it's just been an amazing experience to uh, have my my children, my grown adult sons, work with me, which is uh, you know not something I ever thought would happen, but. Uh, uh, they're they're doing a phenomenal job yes, and they, they enjoy I think they enjoy what they're doing and uh, and yeah we're we're small business owners uh, we all have a stake in the business and uh, yeah being able to to be behind the scenes on radically rational uh, has been a, a a wonderful experience because the the content the leadership the guests are at such a high level uh, I would put this show. Uh, except for this one, because I'm on. No, please. But I would put <laughs> this show uh, really up against any national uh, program that's that's out there, uh, either in this type of uh, environment or uh, on network television as well. It's just that good, and it's that phenomenal, and uh, and the content is, it just speaks for itself. We are blessed to be working with you and your family, and this is not an exaggeration. Game Day Media in San Antonio, Texas, is the premier podcast production house in this country, and John Largent is the country's preeminent authority on this subject. Uh, he's too modest to say it. I will. You have podcaster conventions all over the country. Uh, this guy plans a lot of the agenda, a lot of the programming, is frequently the keynote speaker. This is the dude. Now, let's go back to this free speech thing. Podcasts are a wonderful way to express yourself. And we're really fortunate at Radically Rational to be working with a company and a gentleman of this caliber. So it really is kind of a liberating thing. Perhaps you have aspirations of doing a podcast, and we would encourage that because if you do one, you can become as neurotic as I am. But you, you see my point. But here's the thing. We all have to realize, and I have to realize, that nobody is guaranteed an audience. Again, you have to earn that. But you also have to have the right platform, and you have to have the right partners. And you have been an innovator uh, in this industry, man, and that's got to make you feel great. Yeah, I, it really has been a blast. And, and th the thing that I enjoy more than anything uh, is, is being that fly on the wall and hearing some of the the most compelling content being produced anywhere and giving people a voice like for example you i mean you've already had your name out there but working with people that are doing this for the first time and are um uh looking for that next step and and working with nonprofits and working with organizations that just don't know how to amplify their voice. It, that's really gratifying for us and, and we thoroughly enjoy it. It's the best, best career move I could have ever made. You know you want to do this and I know who can help you. <laughs> and it's John Largent and this wonderful team here at Game Day Media. John, again, thank you so much. Not, not just for the production help, not just for the platform, but for the friendship, uh, for the ear, uh, for the willingness to challenge me, which, which I absolutely welcome. Uh, all I can tell you, it's, it's a wonderful experience, and we're looking forward, forward to it for years to come. 
So again, thank you. This partnership between Radically Rational and Game Day Media, uh, it's worked. It's something we're grateful for. Look, we don't want to get too highfalutin about this, but we really do feel this way. We honestly feel a calling that there is a need to return to a more fact-based society, that we're not going to regain our orientation and equilibrium until we do that. Now, again, that doesn't mean that we have to get preachy about this or lecture anybody about it, because the best way to get this across is to entertain you. And that's what we want to do, not just on Radically Rational, the podcast, but at radicallyrational.com with the daily videos, with the blogs and things of that nature. Ultimately, though, we know that we are beholden to you and that we want to serve you and that we have to earn your interest and your trust. It's something that we want to do. We always appreciate your feedback. That includes your criticism. If nothing else, I will promise you my skin is really, really thick. But radically rational means once again, we're bringing facts back into fashion. We want to make simple sanity sexy again and crazy ain't cool. But this place, Game Day Media, (laughs) certainly is. Yeah, it's been a pleasure uh, working with you to this point. I can't wait to see what's next. And uh, if you haven't gone to radicallyrational.com, do that because there is a treasure trove of content, not just the podcast, but there are daily blogs, there are, there are uh, daily videos. I, I, I think I might be, I see those the first thing every morning. It's like, am I waking up to my wife or am I waking up to Paul? It kind of depends on where I'm at, but... But the content is great. You have sports information on there as well. And uh, if you haven't spent some time at RadicallyRational.com, I highly recommend you do so. It's just nothing else. It's just entertaining, and it's good stuff, and it'll start your day right. Uh, so I highly recommend that as well. And uh, and this has been uh, a blast. I can now say, hey, I co-hosted a show with the one and only Paul Alexander. Yeah, the honor is mine, uh, sure. And again, I am a very cheap substitute for your full-time host Anthony Pittman we hope he gets well soon and uh, we uh, I look forward to being on the other side of the camera next time but this has been absolutely fun for me and I really appreciate uh, you inviting me to do this today this is uh, not something I planned but uh, wow something I really enjoy and I won't forget it one of the cool things about radically rational is we can make just about anything fit under that umbrella At Radically Rational, we're bringing facts back into fashion. We're making simple sanity sexy again. We are rejecting crazy wherever it comes from. want to invite you to visit our website at radicallyrational.com. Daily blogs, daily videos, and of course, we archive all of these wonderful podcasts. We will see you next time on Radically Rational, the podcast. 